morning. It is Ralph Turciano. It is, what's it showing here, 12.26 a.m., October 25th, Sunday morning. And you and I are both going to cover basically the information that occurred over the past seven days, which is strongly pertinent to COVID-19, which most often was not covered by the right side or the left side of the media. Henceforth, you and I are here. So let us begin with the good news. All right, CBD helps reduce lung damage from COVID by increasing levels of protective peptide. Again, I'll put the links on the YouTube channel. This is really kind of cool. What it did, it helped did. It helped increase the natural peptide called apolim, and it's important because it reduced the inflammation as well as improved the oxygen levels. So when you see dramatic in both directions, that's what they mean. So to proceed as forward, CBD's ability to improve oxygen levels and reduce inflammation as well as lung damage in the laboratory model of deadly ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome. Now they have shown that apolin levels, let's make this a little larger for you. There it is. Now they've shown that apolin levels go way down with the viral infection, which has killed a million people worldwide, and that CBD quickly helps normalize those levels along with lung function. Quoting, once again, it was dramatic in both directions, quoting the researcher, and shifting apolin levels in both circulating blood and lung tissue. Blood levels of the peptide dropped close to zero in the IRDS, adult respiratory disease model, and increased 20 times with CBD. CBD almost brought it back to a normal level. And this is apparently the first connection between CBD and apolin. So this is a real, real, another major breakthrough in reference to uh, COVID-19 treatment. And hopefully some of these start getting incorporated into regular uh, responses to COVID-19 for patients. Let's go to the next one. And here we go. Now this is gonna find quite intriguing. This is a basically a caveat in reference to the vaccines. And so here we begin. COVID-19 vaccine trials cannot tell us if they will save lives. Real important. All because something is called a vaccine and it gets a becomes approved as a vaccine doesn't mean it actually works because you'll understand why in a second. From the British Medical Journal, make this a little larger for you, it says none of the trials currently underway are designed to detect a reduction in any serious outcome such as hospitalizations, intensive care use, or deaths. Nor are the vaccines being studied to determine whether they can interrupt transmission of the virus. Isn't that comforting? And part of the reason why, as we make it a little larger here, so you go to the bottom here, hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19 are simply too uncommon in the population being studied for an effective vaccine to demonstrate statistically significant differences in a trial of 30,000 people. The same is true regarding whether it can save lives or prevent transmissions. The trials are not designed to find out. Often you'll hear in the trials, oh, it elicits an immune response, an antibody response, but is it reducing intensive care, death, hospitalizations, or transmission? According to the British Medical Journal, it is difficult to make the determination. Henceforth, the trials cannot tell us if they will save lives. So, best to be warned that vaccines are cool in that aspect. However, in reference to treatment of this new ailment, just buyer beware. To the next element, which is real important, we covered this one a little earlier, and this has to do with transmission. And here we go. For emerging infectious diseases, was back in July. And there's a real important thing here. I had a discussion with a few epidemiologists, and then all of a sudden, as we're talking about this, it dawned on us an extremely important aspect in reference to transmission of COVID that nobody has seemed to cover, even though it appeared in the outcomes of research, it just hasn't latched on. But you and I will look at this, and again, doesn't mean it's the main reason for the transmission of COVID or it could be a large contributing factor, but however, in any case, it has not been solidly addressed. Are you ready? Here we go. Ba, ba, ba. 
Almost all positive results were concentrated in contaminated areas, I follow along, uh, up to 100%. The rate of positivity was much higher for the ICU, you see the rates there, than basically GW. The rate of positivity was relatively high, now you can know where we're going, for floor swab samples, perhaps because of gravity and airflow causing most of the virus droplets to float to the ground. Follow me on this. In addition, as medical staff walking around the ward, the virus can be tracked all over the floor as indicated by the, you ready? 100% rate of positivity from the floor in the pharmacy, for example, where there were no patients. So here you have a scenario where generally none of the infected are entering this particular room. Yet the room is 100% positive for the virus. Now, would you expect the same of a mask or a face shield? Now we're going to look at it in a second, but to proceed. Furthermore, half of all the samples from the soles of the ICU medical staff shoes tested positive. Therefore, the soles of medical staff shoes might be a function as carriers. And here's the correlation. The correlation comes down to this. A lot of the cultures that we're looking at, which seem to have a very low COVID-19 hospitalization or viral load, meaning there could still be high infections, but a low viral load or death rate, seem to have this one unique cultural practice in play. To proceed forward, though. The three-week positive results from the floor dress room, da, da, da. we also have people recommend the persons disinfect the shoe soles before walking out of the wards containing COVID-19 patients. It's beginning to dawn on you now. I know your body is beginning to work. Because patients' masks contained exhale droplets and all secretions, uh, the rate of positivity of those masks was also high, but nowhere near as high as the floor or the trash can or a computer mouse. But let us go to the next level here and you'll see exactly where we're coming from. And da da da. Here it is. So check this out. The floor of the isolation ward, 70% positivity rate. Patients masked, only 40%. Now remember, this is the mask off. The patient is infected with COVID and they're breathing in the mask. Yet the mask is only showing a 40% positivity rate. The floor of the pharmacy, for example, where the tests were taken, where there's no COVID patients entering it. Only people that are treating the COVID patients walking into the pharmacy, tracking the virus on the bottom of their shoes into the pharmacy itself. 100% positivity rate. Now check this out. It could be the material of the face shields or whatever it is. Face shields of the medical staff. Zero positivity rate. Zero. Floor, 100%. Mask, 40%. Floor in the isolation ward, 70%. Face shield, 0%. Now, isn't that befuddling or what? Now, here is where the epidemiology conversation comes into play. And this is where it begins to dawn on you. And this is what epidemiology is all about, is looking for those little clues to why certain cultures are basically seemed like the virus has passed them by in other societies like ours in the United States, it is persistent. You ready? I know you already got it. Here it goes. Because in many cultures, what is happening before you enter a place, a residence, or a restaurant, especially the Asian cultures, take off your shoes. The shoes are left at the front door. Why? because the shoes become a route of transmission because whatever the material is on the bottom of the shoes is picking up the virus, carry it into the house, carry it onto the carpet. And basically what you're doing is you're taking off your shoes with your hands, you're putting the shoes back on with your hands. And the irony is if you have the mask on, cool. But if the virus is living on the soles of your shoes, an epidemiologist can confirm the information like they did here in larger studies then all that would have to happen in order to greatly reduce the mitigation, even though it covered many things that reduced the mitigation of the virus, which are not being practiced, is get shoes that basically are embedded with materials that make it difficult for the virus to adhere. And this is an interesting part too, because obviously we're going to go to Sweden in a second, or the Scandinavian countries. It's like the Dr. Fauci likes to say, is guess what? Let's see, here we go. Up there it is. 
I did not realize this. New Zealand as well, too, is it is a custom not to wear your shoes in the house. So you have a lot of Asian cultures, for example, that basically are renowned for not wearing shoes in the home. And there's a lot of European cultures, the same thing. Of course, here has to do with basically the practice of winter time and mud and so on so and so forth, taking your shoes off before you enter the home, which could be a strong correlation, I don't want to say causative because we don't know, in why the virus does not seem to have the same devastating effect as it has in other cultures. So it's something to look at, but to proceed forward. I will look at it as well. And here we have the first epidemiological uh, research from looking at New Zealand and Thailand, uh, Taiwan. And of course, I want to point out to you Taiwan, again, the least disruptive of any of the countries in reference to COVID mitigation. And yet they had, let's make this a little bigger, da, da, da. The incident is 20.7 cases per million. And also too, they, they avoided a national lockdown completely. And as we go to the data analysis, you know, I always like to point out Taiwan because it looks like it is it has been totally bypassed, even though it's vicinity to Wuhan and China, it is just confounding. That's where epidemiology comes in. What if it is something like taking your shoes off? Again, I'm not gonna harp on that too much, but still, what the heck? Check it out, research it, save lives. To proceed as follows, let's go into the data analysis right now. Here we go. Ba -ba -boom. All right, let's start with uh, Scandinavian countries. You and I are both gonna look at this for the first time. And we're gonna run the kernel and see how those Scandinavian countries are comparing. You know, because obviously COVID has a different effect in Scandinavia, according to certain very prominent medical professionals that are running this whole pandemic show. All right, so here we go. All right, here is our total cases per million, deaths per million, Sweden, USA. Remember, the, Sweden was very heavy in the United States. So depending on how you're looking at the chart, it can really bias you. But as we see forward, you'll understand more. All right, here we go. There's the United States, and this is deaths per million, unfortunately. The United States is still very high. Look at all your Scandinavian countries. And remember Sweden, I'm highlighting here because why? They did very little in reference to pandemic mitigation. To proceed forward again, Iceland, intriguing. Yes, the cases per million skyrocketed, but the mortality rate, unfortunately, a person or two did succumb to it, is very low compared to anywhere near the United States. Look at this. It's infection rate per million went way above the United States. Now it's plummeting again. Look how it goes through the cycle. And maybe that's their second wave they're talking about, but who knows? Proceed forward. All right, we're now looking at new cases smooth per million. And there's Iceland and it's dropping. Remember, this is probably October 24th. I don't know if we pick up the 25th yet. To proceed, uh, new deaths smooth per million. United States right there. Yeah, there is Iceland. Looks like they may have had two consecutive deaths or three. And then it dropped back down to virtually nothing. We'll check that in a second. Again, the data is fresh to me as well. Denmark a little high. United States, still way up there. These countries are not experiencing a second wave. Uh, and the virus itself, these people will not be knocking down the doors trying to get a vaccine. Especially if the vaccine is anything where the British Medical Journal implies is not being tested to anything pertinent to prevention of COVID. To proceed as follows, new cases smooth per million, deaths smooth per million. And there we are right there. Uh, this is new cases we're adding up here. Here is the United States comparatively since uh, September 1st, new deaths smooth per million compared to the Scandinavian countries. I recovered that. There is our numerics right there. And then let's just check out Iceland real fast. This is a uh, new death smooth per million. Uh, do, 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 do you want to find out what happened here? Let's see, Iceland, yeah. So it looked like they had a few bad days right around here. And this was updated October 24th and they went back down to mortality rate of zero. And I don't think I have any more data past that. No. All right, now let's go to number two. This is our data focus in hospitalizations, basically to uh, deaths in the United States itself. This should update automatically. Here we go. And our code is running. Let's get to the top there. 
All right, this is all stuff for me. I apologize. Still on there, still on there. Kendall Tao, da da da. All right, here we go. Hospitalization increases, the positive increases. Now, we had a really high spike there. Now, we're going to look at that in a second, and that's New Jersey's fault. What happened, I have no clue, but it's like they took a bunch of data and just threw it in there. So if you get the news saying, oh, COVID's going crazy for whatever reason, blame it on New Jersey, and we'll look at that in a second. Positive increase, so really we, here we have no correlation between hospitalizations and positive increases still. This still chart still bugs the life out of me uh, because you have this real strong correlation between hospitalization increases and death increases. The reason it bugs me, people are going, well, yeah, well, you have more hospitalizations, of course you have more deaths, is because if treatments truly were improving, you should see a bigger and bigger gap like this between the hospitalization increases and the death increases. Meaning people are coming in, they're being treated, they're being cured, so to say, and they're going home. I'm not seeing that according to this graph. And looking a little closer, this is up to October 25th. Yeah, they just moved to deaths today. And boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I see that real spike there. Now, the news is going to feed on that. They're not going to know what the data means. And so you and I, well, that's what we were doing right now. Let's go by COVID states. And we're going to look at Florida and South Dakota. Here we go. I'm going to run our kernels. Ba -ba -ba. And I am, I apologize, I am moving as fast as I can. And it is now 1243. So here we go. And let's run our data. Do, 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 do. All right, running, 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 running. Yep, da, 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 da. All right, here we go. Now, look, now what we're looking at right here is we are looking at the death increases per 100,000. Now, remember, South Dakota doesn't have a large population. As we look at the whole, it's, it's going to change your perspective. But however, though, here we're looking at means and medians uh, in reference to the uh, basically death increase per 100,000. Florida went below Georgia, even though Florida ended a lot of its lockdowns. It's still all very low. South Dakota is like all across the board. Look, at it, It's like boom, 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 once a week. All right, here we go. Uh, positive increases per 100,000, South Dakota. Now, remember, though, since there was a mutation or antigenic drift in COVID into the G strain as opposed to the D strain, yeah, its transmissibility is higher. Like we look at Iceland, for example, earlier, but its mortality rate is also much lower. But to proceed, here we go. And orange is Florida. And Florida is a little bit below Georgia. And the apocalypse did not occur as uh, was reported in the news that it would be the prediction for Florida. We're going to look at Monte Carlo in a second, the predictions as well. All right, so here we go. And this is death increased total. We'll move past that. Not pertinent, not pertinent, not pertinent. Florida, California, New York. This is in death increase per total. Again, it's, it's the, everything added together. This one, look at positive increase per 100,000. Now look at Florida as far as reporting. You see it's bouncing all across the board. But here, keep this in mind. California has all those weird tiers and lockdowns. And this collateral damage reference to COVID lockdowns. People die. Kids don't go to school. People don't get cancer treatments. Diagnosis, diabetes treatments, heart disease, so on and so forth. So when you look at something like this, and you look at the positive increase per 100,000 to a state that has produced a lot of its lockdowns, compared to one that's still maintaining high lockdowns, it doesn't tell the whole story. But to proceed as follows, all right, death increase per 100,000. There's Florida, California, New York, and this repetitive information, uh, hospitalizations per 100,000. Look at this. New York is beginning to increase. Florida is pretty much uh, straight. I was about to say flat line, which is not the right terminology for hospitalizations. And then California is pretty much there. And of course, this is your, your death increase box plots. Here's your, all your states. This is total to the whole uh, pandemic debacle. And I'm calling it a debacle because it is. Because a lot of uh, methods and methodologies and breakthroughs, which could have worked, somehow got past uh, up through superfluous uh, hyped media uh, treatments and also pandemic mitigation strategies such as masks and lockdowns, uh, which over on global scale does not correlate very well. 
All right, so here we are, and there's your South Dakota. Remember, we looked at South Dakota before, it was all the way up here, and you saw this bouncing all across the board. And then when you look, oh, there it is right there. And then when you look down here, it doesn't look anywhere near as dramatic as something like that. Of course, it doesn't help to send infected individuals to retirement homes, because remember, COVID-19, it needs a firm, uh, planting ground, so to say, in order to really take off. So when you have misguided governors or bureaucrats sending infected individuals to the prime breeding ground for COVID-19, other elderly individuals with compromised immune systems, and then they create uh, or instigate the pandemic, and then they throw in states of emergencies in response to their own mess ups. Yeah, I'm really bitter about that. And so should everyone else. And here we go as far as um, death increases, yeah, per so on and so forth, per state. And as we move through, we can look at that. That's basically pretty high for Montana. I want to double check that figure in reference to that because that is way up there. And certain places, uh, as far as reporting, have not been there. Again, sometimes they just group all the data together and, huh? Yeah, that's what I said too. So let us begin and go to our world data. We're gonna run our kernels. Ready, here we go. I'm gonna speed this up. Again, I apologize as fast as I can. And again, this is all data analysis. I speak a lot about it because again, it's not really covered in the media. You only get one side. You get the scary looking graphs because that forces you to look. It's like clickbait, that's the best way to describe it. All right, world data, all right. Yep, positivity as far as cases increasing like crazy. But however though, where it really counts, new deaths smooth per million, is actually looks like it's still declining. So that's amazing. Now this is what I did here. Is this the percentage of cases of positive COVID cases that you see here? Uh, as a percentage, a reference to deaths. And that's where we are as of October 25th, 1248 AM, declining still. And Monte Carlo scenario that we ran before, pretty much as we looked at the data from uh, September, is pretty much authenticating that. And so here we go. And a really small graph. Going down, 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 repeated. All right, here, look at this. Great Britain. I don't know how much is actually uh, responsible to Great Britain. Here's your dates there. In, in terrifying people or terrorizing people, but it seems like from a correlation standpoint, and again, just my publisher bias in incorporating, every time Great Britain goes in this phase of terrorizing people, it actually seems to cause the, um, in which case we're here, news cases move per million to skyrocket. Almost like a confirmation bias in reference to reporting. We saw that happen with whooping cough. When it was in the news a lot, it got diagnosed more, became diagnosed more, even though the disease was not any more prevalent. So here we are, Sweden, uh, Sweden, yeah, Sweden, right there. Uh, Great Britain, again, cases don't matter as much as what happens when someone's infected. Uh, USA, so on and so forth. And of course, almost forgot, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Singapore. Look at that, right along the x-axis. Again, correlation. Could it be something as simple as that? Or it could be fermented food, whatever it can be, but you know what? You're going to have more likelihood of having COVID on your shoes than you are on a mask. That's pretty, pretty uh, amazing information to come across. And here we go, new deaths per million. And USA uh, and Great Britain, uh, uh, basically locked down, you know, pandemic kingdoms are still a race tied head to head. And look at Sweden, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan. That kind of says it all. Uh, again, they're not gonna be knocking down any doors for a vaccine or even any sort of medication or treatment. They, they must think that we live in a total, totally different world as compared to them. All right, to proceed forward. Uh, this is within a short period of time, since October 11th. And this is Sweden, right there. New death smooth, smooth. And if we look at this, United States, and as we proceed forward, United States, Sweden, again, renowned for not doing much. And of course, it's a Scandinavian country, according to uh, certain pronounced medical professionals. 
So COVID must be treated differently. Uh, unfortunately, one individual did succumb to uh, COVID, looks like, on October 23rd uh, in Sweden, compared to the United States, total 841. All right, and then total cases per million, still doing our comparisons here. Singapore, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. This is cases because in Japan, in Korea, and Taiwan, you really can't even see any deaths there uh, comparatively. To proceed, total deaths per million. I could, I don't have to even scroll down, I can tell you, you could tell which two countries these are right off the bat. All right, and Singapore, Japan, Korea. Now, Singapore is important because, again, they ended, they ended a lot of the pandemic mitigation uh, policies a while ago. And they have an extremely high population density. And yet, when you look at now, today, you know, Singapore in red, non-existent. All right, to proceed. And then we look at collateral damage due to the lockdowns. You know, what's happened as far as medical uh, infrastructure breaking down and a lot of these third world countries, tuberculosis, malaria, so on and so forth. It's just a rough estimate. All right, now we are going to go to our Monte Carlo prediction model. And again, it is October 25th. And we are going to run all kernels. There we go. For those not familiar, what we're doing is we're working off of the past history of disease of the COVID-19 reporting and trying to predict the future. And so far, the Monte Carlo model, as far as I am aware, has not been incorrect. So here we go. We're going back from uh, October 12th. I mean, it's October 12th, August 12th. The reason we choose that date is because that's when we noticed a really strong shift in virus behavior. There's a new death USA there, and now you begin to see a little bit of rise. That could be our second wave. No other country seems to be experiencing a second wave except those which are focused on second waves. Uh, again, confounding or confirmation bias. All right, there we are. Let's check our models out. All right, that's just basically total case prediction, just adding up on top of each other as time goes forward. Um, there's a new cases per million. Pretty much doesn't look like it's going to change all the way up to January 6, 2021. But let's do look at the one that counts, new deaths per million. Our here we are is our standard deviation, our mean, our min, our max. And it looks like right now, at this point in time, we are still going to continue on it. If we pay attention to the Monte Carlo model, a downward slope. And so that's going to January 6, 2021. Now, real rapidly, I want to review the spike from New Jersey. Here we are. New Jersey had some mass reporting. I'm rebuilding the COVID data frame uh, using population base and population per 100,000 reference to hospitalizations, deaths, and positivity, which the COVID tracking data for the United States doesn't seem to have. So I'm going to remake the data frame for us so you and I can get better uh, view of the information and what's going on within our own borders. But to proceed. So here we are. And I'm looking at it, da da da. All right, this is as the October 23rd, 2020. Something happened when they did a reporting in New Jersey, which threw all of our numbers off. Look at that. 12,705 cases or hospitalizations reported in one day. That has to be a reporting error. And so we're looking at that. This is standard deviation reporting because I want to find out who's being honest in regard to reporting and who's not by looking at the STDs, standard deviations. So that is is going to throw our numbers way off. And I doubt that much of the media had reported on that because it is going to throw all the numbers way off. So now if we look at, let's say, the 24th, which was only a few hours ago. Let's run it again. Up, up, up. There we are. We're, there's New Jersey today. So you see the 23rd, you have this massive uh, hospitalization increase. And then all of a sudden, boom, you have whatever. And let's start right here, that's 12,705. Now we're updating to the 24th. Let's see where our numbers are. And see how they change dramatically? That's why it's important to always look at the data. Again, Ralph signing off. Hope you found this information of use. The links will all be there on the YouTube channel. I hope I didn't bore you if you followed me this long. 
And next week, we will still do another review. I'll update that data frame for you so we get a better perspective, see who's being honest and who's not in reference to the reporting, or if we can analyze that or get enough data to make that, uh, uh, how would you say, assumption, if it's even there. But again, data reporting is really interesting state by state. It's, it's not clean, it's not accurate, and it could really cause a lot of fear if they dump all that data at one time and people think, oh my gosh, you know, the dam has broken in reference to uh, pandemic mitigation. Again, we do this because we want to look at other aspects of the other areas of the world. So we have a good control to see if we're doing anything right or doing anything wrong. And right now, we're not doing as much right as other parts of the world. Again, I will review the information as follows. We would look at this. Now I'm blabbering, but it's important. We looked at shoes, shoes, no shoes, no shoes, no virus. Uh, looked at infection rates on the floor, looked at the studies as far as where the infection rates were, uh, looked at the vaccine trials, not really saying anything, except maybe if the vaccine doesn't kill you, uh, at least, I don't know. Next. All right, and then the CBD for baby, extremely effective, even though I know a lot of people moan CBD in certain corners of the world because it's associated with the drug culture. But however, though, you know what? Look at that. That's freaking amazing. Again, we're all signing off. Look forward to see you all next week once again. Catch you then. Bye.